right. Thank you for sticking around, everybody. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for uh, a conversation about uh, this fantastic television show. Uh, in order to help us know a little bit more about what you just saw, allow me to welcome Mr. Jared Harris. Good afternoon. Thank you for making the time to uh, join us today. Not at all. Thank you for taking the time to watch it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so this is obviously a show built on an incredible amount of detail. Yeah. Um, some, some of you may know, some of you might be surprised to know that this was not shot on location. This was shot in a studio. Um, and They would have shot it on location, but the cameras, the, the metal freezes up in the camera. It had nothing to do with the actors. <laughs> they would have sent the actors into the Arctic if they could have, but the... the the machinery stops working when it's that cold. <laughs> so, so you you were in Budapest uh, yeah. uh, shooting this. Um, you've you've been on film and TV projects in the past where you've been on location, and and this one mostly was was in studio. Is there is there a different process for you uh, prepping on a on a particular part, whether it's going to be out in the world or or kind of con contained on a stage? Well, you the, the the last three episodes of this are all on location, and um, I don't know how many of you have actually seen the whole thing. That's a question. Okay. Two. Okay. Check it out. It's really, really, really good. Um, it, I mean, it's a sort of slow des uh, descent into the everything, the the, 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 the situation, the predicament that these characters are under, it just gets more and more dire with each episode but anyway but the last three episodes they they have to abandon ship and they um they try and walk out of the arctic it's an 800 mile journey and um and strangely enough they found uh, there was a islands uh, in croatia that look very like uh, King William Islands and so we went there but the difference is is that when you're in a, a studio you generally get more work done but when you're on location there are just so many different things that um that interfere with you you know there's like helicopters fly over and planes and then things, hold for sound yes <laughs> things don't work and I mean on that particular place that we're at on location in, in Croatia the reason why it looks like King William Island is that nothing grows there and the reason why nothing grows on King William Island it's too cold but in this place in Croatia is they get winds up to 200 miles an hour so nothing can take root there so um, but then you're dealing with that there's a wind starts blowing away your set <laughs> That doesn't happen when you're in studio. <laughs> and, and regardless of whether you are, where you are uh, for this particular project, I, I, I imagine that it was very helpful to have that incredible amount of detail, whether it was in the costuming or, or yes. in the interior of the, the, the captain's quarters, yeah. like that, that, that regardless of where you are, that has to help. Yeah, it does. I mean, you're the, it helps with that sense of the claustrophobia that these people were experienced because they were trapped out there for three and a half years and um and they couldn't move and uh so you know the, the, their living quarters is all essentially that one deck of the ship and um they where the, the you see them whether they, they're eating they put the tables up and they sling their hammocks and that's where they sleep and um so you know it, it's it's a really a noisy environment it's obviously smelly you know and then uh, um and then that sense of everybody knowing getting to know one another past the point where you you're, you you know pe people's uh, f uh, foibles become irritating and there's that sort of constant grit that amongst the human interaction amongst people um we all got on really really well um uh which was a fantastic thing um and that, I think that's partly because it was an english uh, cast and we there's a sort of healthy um, sort of what would they call it? Um, you know, uh, um, where you, you t we call it taking the piss out of each other, and uh, so there was a little healthy disdain that people would have <laughs> for everybody, <laughs> which you would imagine would be the same if you were on a ship together for yeah. uh, years yeah. and years and years. Yeah. Um, so because you have so many different characters in this show uh, that are united in the same purpose on this expedition, but also. Uh, as the series goes on, you find that they respond to the challenges of this expedition in very, very different ways. Um, it seems like the, the 
you all got along pretty well. Was there were there different approaches to how to play a character like this over the course of ten episodes, or 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 did you? Well, some people because part of the storyline is their food source uh, is contaminated. So you see in that early scene where the uh, one of the captains pulls out, he doesn't know what it is, and he puts it down. It's a pellet. It's a piece of lead. So the this was uh, it was right after the Napoleonic Wars and and canning. F- uh, tinned food was developed by Napoleon during the Napoleonic Wars. So they, this is a new food source that they have. And, um, but they didn't understand the, the sort of the importance of vacuum sealing and, you know, properly cooking the food. So the food's got botulism in it, and, um, and uh, so it's slowly poisoning them. Um, but this, the idea of that was that it was the there was a bit of the lead sold that hadn't been uh, hadn't been done properly. But um, wait, I know I've lost the thread of why I was talking about that. <laughs> D- different characters and different. Oh yeah, so 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 they run out. They so, <laughs> so they start to starve, right? So some of the people took that. Uh, the actors took that very seriously. Um, uh, Adam Nagatis, who plays Hickey, he decided to go on a purely vegan diet, um, and to the point where after the shoot was over, he was starting to, he was n- not well, and his doctor basically said um, he had taken this diet so seriously that his body was consuming its own organs and he had to start eating meat again. Uh, um, and then, uh, and Tobias and I, we, we had a, a competition to see, like, because by the end of the story, you want to look gaunt, as which one of us could, could uh, you know, look gaunt. He's very competitive. <laughs> I'm just going to say that. <laughs> and I think he won. <laughs> Uh, I, I, one of the things that I love about the show is, is you basically just gave a, a little bit of a, a, a history lesson about vacuum sealing things. That there are so many different threads in this show that are obviously tied to historical uh, fact and historical mm-hmm. basis. Even though this is uh, sort of taken from Dan Simmons' novel, and then and then David and Sue kind of uh, adapted it uh, for for TV. Um, but you had the opportunity to interact with some of the the artifacts and some of the personal effects of. Crozier himself and and to really sort of get into that mindset um, did that uh, I, I imagine that helps uh, when, when yeah. you're playing someone who actually exists to to, to come in contact with the actual physical uh, evidence of, of well I got alive. copies of his letters um, so the, he, the, the last uh, communiques that, that, that were sent out before they go into the Arctic Circle and there's a series of letters whilst they were um, they, they were uh, uh, getting the stores onto the ship and everything um, and there's a series of letters at the Maritime Museum uh, at Greenwich in England, and um, you you can really see this man's state of mind, and and the, he refers to the fact that he'd been rejected by Sophia, and that he's he no longer has any other hopes for his life other than he's married to the naval life and to the sea. And it's almost, there's a sort of wistful feeling in his letters of like, hey-ho, it's the bustle of the sea for me then, I suppose. And, and, um, um, and that he's been overlooked by, um, he sh- as second in command, he should have been responsible for crewing up the ships and fitting out the ships. But the Admiralty was so convinced that they were going to find this Northwest Passage at this point that they wanted the discovery to be an English discovery. And so they crewed the ships with English people, English uh, seamen, who didn't have the same experience in Arctic exploring as uh, a lot of those, uh, th- those sailors were, were Welsh or Irish or Scottish. But they didn't want the guy in the crow's nest who spots it to be anything other than English. So um, there was a largely inexperienced crew that was on board the ships. And he was upset that he, b- he was being overlooked, that he was being usurped in his, what should have been his re- responsibility in his role. And um, there were several letters of people who saw him at the time saying they'd never seen a more melancholy Irishman in their life um, than this man at this point in his life. And, that, and, and his drinking was, uh, was well known at that point as well. So, I mean, there's a lot of things there that bolster the story, which of course is what Dan Simmons had did his uh, use for the research for his book. Is there a point when you're playing a, a, a character who existed in real life? Is there a point where you can learn too much about that person, where you, where you feel almost too indebted to the person who exists in real life and not the version that you're playing? So this is a good acting question because uh, um, you're the re- it's always good to do the research 
but you're not you're the version of the character you're playing is the version of the character that the writer has chosen and you're playing the writer's version of that character and they've already done that research and they've made a decision about what facets of that personality and story are useful for their narrative so it's always good to uh to do all that research because you never know when you're on set when someone's going to ask you a question and you've got the answer immediately because you, you did the research they want to change something and you can you can pick something out from the research that you know is accurate and authentic but um but you can't get too bothered if that stuff's not there i mean i i remember when i played andy warhol and i shot andy warhol I did all this research and then I read the script and you know it's about 10% of it was in there but the way that I looked at it was it's it's the same way as a you know a pianist sits down at a piano and they don't just bang on all the keys all at once because they know what, you know how to play all the keys at the same time and the that knowledge that you have of what all the other notes sound like will infuse the choices that you make you know but you can't yeah so it's fast it can be frustrating but you're not at that point of the you know the process that all those decisions get made before an actor ever gets into the room and, and that's that's where i i it, it seems like on this project project in particular uh being able to interact with with uh david and sue on a regular basis to to make sure that that your interpretation was kind of in line with their intent and, and, and that you were able to be on the same page. Like that, that, that seemed to be a, an important part of this process. Yeah, I mean, that's something that I observed on the set of Mad Men and that was, it's really important for the showrunner to be present because if the showrunner is in another city on the other side of the continent or in another country, it's really difficult to have real-time conversations with them about questions that you have about the material or thought ideas that you have, because um, it's the middle of the night there probably where they are and you're trying to solve a problem, you've got 30 seconds to do it. So if they're there, you can have real-time discussions with them and you can chuck ideas up and if they like them, they'll use them. If they don't like them, then you know you just keep chucking up other ones. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that process may have been a little different than, than this one as far as how much you knew about the character going in. Obviously this one's a, yeah. a, a more self-contained pr yeah, process. Yeah, well you had the book, you could read the book, you could read the historical stuff. And they, when we started filming, they had the first four episodes. Uh, so you had a really good idea of what they had in mind in terms of the style of the show and what they were going after. And in fact, one of the first questions that I asked them when they sent me the first episode and to see if I was interested, I, I said, this isn't going to sort of devolve into being a monster show where we're all screaming in terror running from a monster for nine episodes or ten episodes and they said no 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 I mean obviously it's there because it's in the book and it's it's there as a sort of a, you know a metaphor if you like but this really is a character uh, it's a psychological drama about how what what happens to these people when they're stripped of everything that they thought made them made them civilized and um, and what they end, what they sort of devolve to in uh, how far will they go to to survive? What will they do to to preserve themselves? Uh, and that was fascinating because that was all there in that in that original episode. And and kind of going off that, one of the things that I think you had mentioned, and and then David and Sue as well, it, in crafting the story was realizing that all these characters at different times make the realization that they've gone from an adventure story to a horror story and yeah that that, that it's, it's yeah. different for everyone it, it doesn't all happen at the same time yeah that was a question about what point does your character step into a horror story and uh um because it all happens at different times in my character in episode five and I, I mean i initially would have said it would be in episode five because he has to uh he has to go uh cold turkey from his his at that point his drinkings become excessive um but there's a point much later on in the story where i mean i don't know if i should I'm giving stuff away or not but um there's a point at which um there's a mutiny so a group of people decide to break off um and uh they're going to go their own way and they and and um but they lack food but dead bodies are good sources of food and um, he's been captured and he's looking at this dead body and he realizes that they, this group of people have now devolved to that and that that's where his future is. And, and 
it, it, it's 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 a very harrowing sequence if you haven't seen it yet. So just be prepared that it, that's on its way. But but that kind of gets to another point is, is that that. That that's not the end of the story. No, there's no, a no, lot no, more. No, no, no. There, there, there is. I haven't given the end away. <laughs> there's more. There's plenty more. There's plenty more. But I, I think there, there is for each of these characters. There is a trajectory, and, yes. and obviously, there's obviously you don't shoot everything in sequence on every project, and and so. But in this project in particular, it seems like it would have been really important to to know at each what each scene you're shooting whether it's in the order that that you've shot them yeah. or not. What, at what point in that process that Crozier is. That's sort of becoming a more common thing now, which is, it is really difficult about block shooting. And that is that they just, instead of shooting one episode at a time, they'll shoot two or three episodes at a time. And it is really, it's really hard to, to put yourself, as you say, in the right place, but also you can't anticipate what you're going to discover in a scene that you're shooting. Um, in, a week's time that precedes the one you're shooting today so it, it's a, it is a frustrating process but you um you you just ha i guess it just you just have to sort of prepare more um luckily in this one we block shot in three episodes at a time so uh, and the important thing about uh, that part with regards to specifically the question was you need to have an idea of what your character trajectory is going to be and you get an, an indication of what that is from the showrunners so that again you so you can make interesting your choices make diversions you don't want to give it away in terms of where your character's going it's quite interesting to make a left turn when everyone expects you to make a right because you know you're going to make a right turn in you know two episodes time you know so um that's all very useful when you in, uh, uh, in getting that information from them and especially kind of talking in vague broad terms this covers maybe a lot more ground uh time wise than you would expect yeah and and so yeah. the, the, especially when you're jumping that far ahead at certain points like like the it, it seems important to to make sure that you're not you're not you're not tipping your hand too much of something that's going to happen eight months down the road right. in the show's timeline right and, and again one well, one of the things that i admired greatly about the writing on this show was that every character quite often you have the way that uh, narratives are constructed now is is essentially you have your lead character and the the narrative of the story is the journey of that lead character and everything is written either to get the audience to uh, be on side with that journey or to frustrate that journey so you have antagonists and protagonists but it's essentially one person's world if you like but what was really good about the writing of this is that everyone is written from their own point of view and every even Hickey's point of view which he turns out to be the antagonist in the story he's justified and and they made it so that his argument for survival is actually a very valid argument and it was the advice that they were given before they set sail by the uh, by the Arctic explorers who said don't go there with these big giant ships with 60 people each on board because if something goes wrong and you have to survive in the environment there isn't enough food you know you won't there's just not enough there so if you go with small crews of 20 people you could live off the land and you should copy the way that the Inuit live and you should live the way that they live and, um, and uh, one of the funny things that came along was they advised them to take dogs to pull the, pull the sleds and the English were horrified and they said well you can't do that to a dog you know a dog's a pet um, and, um, and they, they said no it'd be completely unfair you know use people to pull them you know instead um, and of course they, they brought these uh, their ideas uh, their imperialistic ideas with them and that's part of what goes wrong but Hickey's version is much closer to the advice they were given um, before they set sail but Hickey's version of survival doesn't include anybody everybody it really only ultimately includes himself that's true um, as part of this uh story uh you have lady silence as a character which uh gave you the opportunity to learn or at least learn some some words of a new language yes. how, how was that process for you <laughs> i remember saying um uh just don't schedule the scenes where i have to speak inuit in the beginning just get i need a like i need two weeks to uh, work with the uh, the person that we had so like and i didn't learn inuit but i could uh, you learn to parrot it and sort of hopefully say it in the right stress because it's all a tonal language and of course it was like my third day they said oh, we scheduled it for the third day 
and um, and then there was one. There's a huge scene in episode five that went through loads and loads of rewrites. Where I had the most, I have an argument in Inuit with Lady Silence, and that was written the night before. Uh, so I had it piped through in the old Brando earpiece. <laughs> um, but again, it was you know, and the, the 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 operator, the sound operator was Hungarian. He didn't speak great English, so he just pressed all the cl the cues at once. So I get all the lines coming through. <laughs> so. The outtakes of that are pretty hilarious because it's me going, no, not that line. Go back, yeah, that line. Okay, stop that. Play that one again. Yeah, just say, just play that one again. Okay, just that line again. Okay, okay. Then I try and parrot it, but yeah, it was really difficult. <laughs> Although um, uh, Nevi did say that by the end of it, I could construct basic sentences in Inuit, and that I spoke better Inuit than her husband. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Tiny victories. <laughs> Small uh, victory. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it, it's been uh, it's been a few months since the show premiered, uh, and yeah. obviously it's been a few months before that that, that you're in production on it. it. Having had a little bit of distance from it now, are there scenes or moments that stand out to you now that maybe you didn't think would be important, or 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 that you would remember? It's all still. I I watch it and I remember um, what happened that day. I rem you know, it's still. The whole, for me, when I'm looking at it, I remember everything about making it. So it's still not, uh, you know, when I watch it, it's still not an imaginative thing yet. You know, it takes a couple of years for that to happen where you can just watch it and you're completely divorced from whatever went into creating that scene. Because there were some scenes that, were, that we went back and forth over a, a lot in terms of um, trying to going through rewrites and stuff like that to try and nail it down. Um, so you, and all of that stuff stays with you in terms of your sort of sense memory. You know, so it, it takes a while for that to disappear. Uh, we have a couple of questions from people here uh, in the audience. Um, we, have, we have one from from Alex who asks, uh, "Did your theater training come in handy when performing on those green screen stages?" <laughs> uh, I, yes, I, I see what you mean because it's a, it's all imaginative. Yeah. Well, you know, the good thing about the green screen stages was it was mostly used for the panorama. So we had practical um, uh, ships. We had practical ice stages for when you had to walk off the ship and walk on the ice. Um, there's episodes there where we're, um, we, we're some, you know, we get lost out in, in the middle of these giant um, sort of, uh, well, I forgot what they call them, but they're the big ice, um, ice walls and... Uh, and they were all practical as well. So um, uh, the theatre training, interestingly, it, it sort of came in useful with the idea of, you know, you have to, um, in theatre, the person who's leading the company has to look out for, for everybody else, you know. And, um, and, and in that sense, it was, it was useful because part of what the responsibility that I felt was, as production goes into, there's problems with production, you run behind and um, uh, think things get cut. Um, stories, character stories start to get trimmed and um, I thought it was important to, to defend those actors with regard to how important those stories were going to be ultimately to the whole narrative. Um, and one of the, I mean, in particularly at one point, a lot of Hickey stuff was getting cut, and I was saying, you know, he, he's the whole second half of the, the of the season. Um, he, he's driving the whole thing, and you, it's it, it's you can't cut that stuff in the first half, you know, um, which uh, yeah, David and Sue were uh, on board with. I mean, they felt the same way, but you know, you have got pressures that are to do with scheduling and time and money. It's always it always comes down to money basically, because it's never enough. <laughs> but one of the nice things about the show that in its final form is that mm. you do have a lot of scenes of, I, I can't think of many other shows on TV that would have a, that would set aside six minutes to have a dialogue scene between two characters. Like that, that, yeah. that it, it's, it's really rare and it really, it seems like from an actor standpoint that, that helps you find a character more than just kind of having to come in, say a few lines and then take off. Yeah. I, mean, I, you know, again, that was that all of that came from David and Sue, the showrunners, and they they had a determination to take a uh, f find a different way to arrive 
at a, a resolution of a scene that you haven't felt you've seen before and not to rely on um, uh, you know either cl cliches or things that are familiar and they they really challenge themselves to uh, to come up with uh, new approaches but also they saw it essentially as a human drama even though it's a you know it's uh, it's a historical story and it's a psychological drama. It's a part horror show, part suspense, part adventure. They saw it as a essentially a human drama, and that and that the thing that drove the whole thing was going to be the 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 richness of the characters, where you really feel connection to everyone mm. and everything. That, that, yeah. that there's a justification for everything, like you mentioned with Hickey. Yeah. Um, we have a question from uh, Nathan who asks, uh, "Will you ever star in a Marvel movie?" <laughs> Nathan yeah which one do you think I should be in <laughs> yeah um, uh, I don't know I, I haven't I, that hasn't come along yet I, I mean if the right one came along Nathan I, I wouldn't do it I'll, you'll be the first to know as well <laughs> thank you uh, we have a question from Patricia who asked uh, what it was like to, as a young thespian, uh, to be the son of a movie star himself. Uh, I didn't know that I wanted to be an actor till quite late. Um, uh, it was uh, it was at Duke University. I went to Duke University, and um, I sort of fell into it there. Um, what was it like? I mean, you know, for a while that that would be the first question that I would always get, and weirdly in America. I don't get asked that question until normally towards the end, um, uh, but in, in England still they're they're quite they're still obsessed, and particularly in Ireland as well. But you know, I, I for me it was I still find it to be useful. I still find it to be um, I'm learning things, uh, thinking about him, watching him, uh, examples that he had, and mostly it's the how he dealt with his career, how he dealt with opportunities, um, and uh, and a passion for it as well, because one of the, once, I was very shy growing up, really, really shy, and I still am, um, uh, but I, he didn't think that I would be an actor. He thought my younger brother would be an actor. And um, when I was at Duke, I started to, I got interested in it and started to do it. And he, my mother came to see me and said, oh, you should go and see him. He's actually pretty good. You should go. And she said, oh, yeah, you, you would say that. You're his mother. Um, so at, w after I graduated, I did a play there and he came down and he saw me. And I'll never forget the look on his face when I came out. He had this huge smile. Uh, and it was yeah after it was after the, uh, after the play was over. This big smile on his face, and he was just he and it was he said, "Christ, you 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 got it. You've really got it." And um and what it, he was excited about was there was a whole new topic of conversation that we could have together. Like I could share his world and his interests. Uh, and so at dinner we'd sit down and he would talk about. Uh, he, he seeing Olivier playing Titus Andronicus, and he would act out the the big moments that that, uh, that Olivier had. Or uh, again, Olivier playing Macbeth, and he has this famous death scene where he he falls down this flight of stairs and dies with his head out towards the audience, having been stabbed in the stomach. And um, and and he would describe these great performances and what they meant to him and why. Uh, why they what was different about them to other ones and that was about the interpretation and the choices that they made as performers as actors to solve different problems in those uh, in that material and and he was you know, obviously he was excited that I was interested in those answers That's okay. Uh, so going forward now, uh, now that you have this experience, uh, you, you've 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 worked extensively in TV and film. Now uh, I, that seems like a almost a, uh, a a weird distinction at this point because they are kind of converging sure, and are, yeah. are becoming very similar. But was there was there something about this project that now you you look for something different now when you're deciding to be a part of a project or or, or, or want to pursue something that 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 this TV project kind of Put in inside your brain. No, I mean you'd you'd hope that the opportunities that come along again, the material is going to be as rich as this one is. But I mean that's just you know it's still pretty rare. Um, you know you're you're you can choose. 
to wait until something comes along that's as exciting or you know you can work oh, i prefer working <laughs> you know you got to keep going you know so and you never know i mean the, the thing to me that i have had this conversation several times with different people over the last couple of weeks was you never really know what's going to i mean you can read something and you can think ah oh, you know this is it's not it's not brilliant um and then you do it and it 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 can surprise you and the example that i give is that Leonardo da Vinci, he was hired to paint a portrait. And his interest was in doing these big uh, uh, um, Christian epic triptychs and these, and these inventions and stuff. But the Mona Lisa turned out to be his signature work and it was a job. He was hired to do it. You don't know what's going to be the thing that suddenly clicks. Yeah. And, and it is... I imagine part of that comes with collaborators too. That 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 sometimes you you might you might be keen to work on something to work with somebody, yeah. rather than like maybe the, maybe the story isn't isn't what you would think, but yeah. the chance to work with somebody who maybe you admire or have always wanted to work with. There's several good reasons for saying yes to a job, <laughs> employment being number one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, but if you get to work, if you're getting to work with a, a director who you admire then you should say yes even if um you know I, I did sean penn's movie the last face and i didn't really have a part in that movie but i just wanted to watch to see how he puts it together how he how he directs um similarly with uh, on allied it wasn't a great part but i wanted to see how robert zemeckis directs a movie and how he you know, how he puts that visually how he creates a story so and it was worth it for those reasons the same with you know i, I mean Ulysses S. Grant wasn't a huge part in, in Lincoln, but it was a good part. But I, I got to spend about seven or eight days on a set with Steven Spielberg, you know, and watch how he makes a movie. Not, not a bad gig. Not a bad thing at all, <laughs> no. And, and neither was the terror. Uh, pretty good, uh, another pretty good gig. Uh, thank you for, for taking thank the time you. to talk with thank us. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming, and we'll see you at another one of these. Thank you.